The North American legal cannabis market is expected to reach $32 billion by 2028. Unfortunately, recent cannabis stock market volatility has made it difficult for many investors to find opportunities to participate. Pura Verde Cannabis is in a position to become the leader in the pharmaceutical cannabis movement through technology, innovation, and growth. As one of Oklahoma's top private label manufacturers, Pura Verde is seeking investors to help them bring their A-game business model to other states. To learn more about investing in Pura Verde, their 13 private label brands, and the advantage of being located in Oklahoma, go to puraverdecannabis.com slash investors. This is not financial advice. Before making any investment purchases, we strongly recommend that you consult with your own financial or investment advisor. From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. And let me welcome you back to the Cannabis Podcast. This is episode 109. If this is your first visit, well, here's an especially warm welcome for you. We're going to feature, let's see information about cannabis for the next 30 or 40 minutes or so. If that's what you're looking for, you came to the right place. Let me remind you, this program is intended for those 19 or older in your jurisdiction and is intended primarily for entertainment purposes. And you should always consume your cannabis responsibly. And I guess there's the occasional educational purpose that's served by the Cannabis Podcast as well. So let's not forget that. In episode 109, well, guess what? It's been four years now since cannabis has been legalized in Canada. It happened on October 17th, 2018, and now here we are, well into the end of October 2022, four years later. We're going to get a sense of, of how I feel about what's happened in the last four years. And in those four years, there's been a few things that have changed, and there's been a few things that have been pretty consistent. The thing that has been very consistent, the excise tax. I've got a couple of stories that talk about the excise tax from two different perspectives. One, that cannabis companies are way in deficit with paying their excise taxes. And it's being pointed out now by a a group that says craft cannabis is going to die because of the excise taxes. So we have two perspectives on that. Plus, guess what? Another country is going to be legalizing recreational cannabis. Germany is coming on board. We're going to take a review of all of the countries and all of the areas around the world where cannabis is legalized. And while we're doing that, we're going to note where people are listening to the Cannabis Podcast all around the world. And of course, if this is the Cannabis Podcast, there must be a cultivar corner coming up. And that's something, again, local, very local. Valhalla Flower in the Okanagan, and we are going to taste their delicious rainbow lava. That and more coming up on episode 109 of the Cannabis Podcast. And before we get too far in, let me thank a couple of longtime subscribers. Well, hi there, Furnace. And you hear the sound? You hear that sound? That is the sound that I deal with many times when producing the Cannabis Podcast that you never hear because it means I will have to re record without the sound of my furnace behind it. I thought you might like to hear some of that, just for amusement purposes. All right, to quote somebody, I don't find this stuff amusing anymore. (laughs) But perhaps you'll find this amusing. It's been four years since we have had legalized cannabis in Canada. Oh, right, I was supposed to thank my subscribers. That's what I was supposed to do before the furnace interrupted me. And then, of course, I got sidetracked. Maybe I smoked a joint in the middle. I... That that might have happened. I won't deny that it's a possibility. Let me thank Kevin. Kevin has been a longtime supporter of the podcast. I uh, really appreciate your support, Kevin, every single time, every single month. Thank you so much for being here, buddy. And Rob. Rob has bought me a bunch of doobies. Now he's a, a subscriber. Thanks so much, Rob. Appreciate you coming along for the ride and the fact that you support me in this. I really do. Now, four years. It's been four years since legalized cannabis happened in Canada. It was October 17th, 2018. I can tell you what I was doing that day. Do you remember what you were doing? (laughs) I wonder if years from now we'll have that conversation. So what were you doing? October 17th, 2018. I was at a Toastmasters meeting. I was actually Toastmaster that day. And guess what the topic was? 
legalization of cannabis. <laughs> it was the first time that I, shall we say, used the term came out to my uh, Toastmasters club in terms of my cannabis usage and my passion for cannabis, which they be, soon became very apparent to them <laughs> and became legendary, in fact, in our Toastmasters club, and how quickly I could take a topic that was raised in, in table topics, for example, and I could turn that around and, and end up having something to do with cannabis by the time the story was over. <laughs> Maybe that's why I don't go to Toastmasters anymore, because I, I think they were getting a little tired of it, and I, I detected that. <laughs> Perhaps not. I, I may be wrong in my interpretation of that. Okay, I digress a little bit. Four years of legal cannabis in Canada. What's that meant to you? Has that has that been has there been an effective change in in how you buy? Are you continually buying from the legal market? Is that your primary source? Or do you still dabble with your dealer on occasion? Or maybe you're in into the between market, hitting all the, the stores on, on the outskirts. Oh, you know, where there's plentiful supply. And you know, if that's where you like to get your cannabis, that's fine with me. Sourcing is entirely up to you. It is a different world. As I have pointed out many times, when legalization occurred, because I was finally now able to legally walk down the street or go out in my backyard or, or at, at any occasion where I could smoke a cigarette, I could could smoke a joint. That was huge for me. That was absolutely huge. As, as you may have heard in some of the stories I've told over the years, there was some, there was some problems over the years with the fact that cannabis was illegal and you weren't supposed to be smoking it. And, and some people took that really to heart. So that, that really mattered. That really changed my life from that perspective. It also made me realize, again, that because I'm so passionate about what this plant has done for me and has done for my life and how I live my life and how I have seen it impact others, that I wanted to express that passion and share it with others. And, and that resulted in the birth of the Cannabis Podcast almost four years ago. That was actually December 1st of 2018 when that first launched. So I'm sure I'll be celebrating that when we hit the episode around that December 1st mark. But what has changed in those four years? Not much. <laughs> We've been hoping, of course, for a review, and we're going to touch on a story a little bit later about, about that review and what some of the upcoming changes could perhaps be. But we've been waiting for that for a while because so many of the things, although we had legalization, we had the simple fact that we could legally possess cannabis and not worry about getting busted for it. There were still so many wacky things, like the 10 milligram limit for edibles like the wacky equivalency for drinks. So you couldn't even buy a six-pack of cannabis drinks because they were equivalent to what they considered to be more than 30 grams of dried cannabis. I mean, they were absolutely absurd. <laughs> and remember, remember in those early days, the dry, dry cannabis? I talked about it on a, on a couple of cultivar quarters in those early days where you could pick up that bud and it would just crumble in your fingers into dust. Thank goodness those days are gone. I haven't seen any of that in the legal market for a long time. I'm sure there still is the occasional stuff that's been hanging around in somebody's warehouse for a while. That's still a problem in the legal market. We need to move things a little faster through it so we get quicker turnover from farm to processor to consumer. Some are accomplishing that. We are getting some weed that was packaged like in the last two weeks before it comes into the store. That's fabulous. So that's that's been a big change. And the other big change that I, I thought was really interesting is over the course of those four years, the THC. We've talked about it many times about how there is, and of course, because, the, because those of us who imbibe in cannabis are dependent on that THC level for the high that we're trying to achieve, we've all fallen under that I think a little twisted understanding that, that that level of THC needs to continually rise to get the same effect. And, uh, well, <laughs> it's a debate that is ongoing. But I thought it was really interesting. I took a look back. In episode four, we did an explain that strain. That's what we called Cultivar Corner when we first started out. Uh, it was Broken Coast Galliano and the THC 18.6%. That's what we were starting out with back in 2018, four years ago. 
And what are we doing this episode uh, in Cultivar Corner? <laughs> We're going to feature a local flower that was done here in the Okanagan by a local company called Valhalla Flower. It's called Rainbow Lava, and the THC on that is at 29.2%. Somewhere in the middle of that, let's say episode 46, I took a peek at that. Citizen Stash Mac 1 is what we did, and the THC was 22.3%. So we've gone from 18 to 29% in roughly four years. No, you're not thinking that, are you? That in another four years, we're going to be at, with flour in the 39 to 40% THC range, it's not possible. Well, I I don't know if it's biologically possible. (laughs) It seems absurd. Another thing that is a lot different now than it was four years ago is our discussion of terpenes. It was in episode three or four that we introduced the concept of terpenes, so we knew that they were there, but we weren't keeping track. (laughs) When you bought a pack of cannabis from a legal store back in October 17, 2018, there was no mention of terpenes on there whatsoever. It had the THC, it had the CBD listed, but terpenes, nah, nothing, nada. <laughs> and then, over the course of those four years, they started to show up. A label here, a label there, would now just have, say, here are the terpenes. No percentages initially, just identifying what the names of the terpenes were. And then slowly the percentages started to creep in. And now here we are four years later, and on many packages now it's not only the THC that's being listed in percentage, it's also the terpene percentage, the total terpene percentage, and in many cases the percentage of up to perhaps the six top terpenes in that particular lot. That's that's a lot of change. (laughs) And it's great that many, many more LPs are starting to figure that out, that that's part of the game, giving us that information, letting us be the ones to decide what terpene profiles are the sweetest spot and and provide that sweet spot for each of us. So that's been a huge change in the last few years. It has been four years since cannabis was legalized in Canada. Wow. It has certainly been a ride. There's still there's still a stigma, of course, out there. Had a customer in last week, and I asked if he wanted a bag. He said, yeah, yeah, unfortunately, my neighbors don't, don't have the same opinion as I do. And that still sucks. Like, the fact that we're still worried about people's opinion about whether we smoke cannabis or not still really bugs me. That That's, that's the biggest thing about stigma that just gets under my skin and just irks the crap out of me that why, why do we care if someone else doesn't like the fact that we smoke cannabis? I know that's personal, and and, and I know I shouldn't keep bringing it up, but (laughs) it's in my nature, and that's just what I do. So there you are. We have completed four years of legal cannabis in Canada. Let's hope we get some changes. We know that some of these things have to change. Like, for example, again, the 10 milligram limit on edibles. <laughs> I understand that, that for those just who are just starting out, yeah, okay, that may work. But for the vast majority of cannabis users who have been cannabis users for a while, 10 milligrams just doesn't cut it. That's got to change. Now, what do companies do to get around that? This is where we find innovation in the cannabis industry. So the latest thing is lozenges. They can get over that 10 gram limit per package when we put them in lozenges. Because in a lozenge package, now available, 10 milligrams per lozenge and 25 lozenges in the package, meaning the package has a content of 250 milligrams of THC. And that brings us to the ridiculous equivalencies to dried cannabis. In the Well, in fact, today, even with some cannabis beverages, you cannot buy a six-pack because that would be more than 30 grams of dried cannabis in their stupid equivalency rules. (laughs) That's got to change. There's There's so much that has to change. And I guess one of the biggest things that has to change 
is the excise tax. And that's the subject of our next story. From the Cannabis Infused Studio in the Clouds, this is the Cannabis Podcast. And we are going to newsfilecorp.com for a press release on our next story, which is pretty important if you care about cannabis in Canada. The cannabis industry leaders are calling for immediate government intervention to prevent systemic failure of small businesses and craft farms. Today, StandForCraft.com, in association with the Cannabis Council of Canada and the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, published their latest in a series of working papers demonstrating the need for immediate intervention in excise tax policy for Canadian cannabis. Even the most commercially successful and efficiently run farms cannot continue to operate in an environment which often federally taxes them in excess of 30% of monthly top-line revenues. No other consumer-facing industry in Canada is taxed to this extreme certainly none with a widespread and low-cost illicit competitor that does not bear the burdens of tax nor regulatory compliance. The paper demonstrates a systemic lack of break-even income levels for firms large and small across the sector. It articulates a specialized need to preserve small business participation in Canada's nascent cannabis industry, with targeted relief combating the growing balance of $100 million currently overdue to the Canada Revenue Agency. Firms cultivating and processing cannabis in the Canadian industry are likely 98% absent self-sustaining break-even income. Two-thirds of reporting entities owe the CRA an exponentially widening outstanding debt. 47% of all CCAA filings in the first six months of 2022 came from the cannabis industry. These financial metrics demonstrate the desperate reality of material overtaxation, with end consumers paying well over half of their retail price to federal excise and provincial markups. Stanford Craft recommends several proven policy strategies, battle tested in other sectors and cannabis jurisdictions. Recommended recalibration includes moving to a 10% tax rate that adapts to price fluctuation, graduating taxation based on production volume, prioritizing small business participation, unifying a national excise stamp, normalizing payment terms to align provincial payables with excise timelines, encouraging provinces to rationalize markups and tariffs, eliminating Health Canada's 2.3% regulatory fee. The Cannabis Council of Canada supports the call for urgent action in response to the unprecedented financial crisis raging in the legal cannabis sector, said George Smitherman, President and CEO of the Cannabis Council of Canada. The extraordinary increase in cannabis producers who have fallen into default with CRA due to oversized excise tax obligations is an alarm for action. Canada's excise tax regime is inefficient and imposes significant administrative and economic burdens on businesses who operate across Canada, particularly small-scale cultivators and processors, said Michael Harvey, VP of Policy and International for the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. The legal sector therefore risks being uncompetitive with the illegal market, given that these illicit businesses are not required to pay the cost of compliance. Reform is needed now more than ever to help our legal sector grow and displace the legacy market, he continued. Alongside industry leaders like the Cannabis Council of Canada, Deloitte and Ernst & Young, Stanford Craft has been supplying data and analysis on the inherent overtaxation of the cannabis sector in Canada for over two years, said Dan Sutton, founder of Stanford Craft. The time for intervention has come and gone, and without immediate action, the participation of small businesses in the future of legal Canadian cannabis is materially at risk, Sutton added. This coalition is recommending short-term roundtable emergency intervention planning inclusive of small business, health ministry, Finance Ministry, Innovation, Science and Economic Development, and the Canada Revenue Agency. And I will have an interview with Dan Sutton from Stanford Craft. He's also the CEO of Tantalus Labs, and he'll be on the next Cannabis Podcast. That's a very important story. And in fact, here's the other side of the excise tax story. And for that story, we are going to mjbizdaily.com, where we stop a lot. 
And in fact, we've done a lot of stories written by Matt Lamers, their international editor, and here's another one. A growing number of Canadian cannabis businesses are fading to pay their federal excise taxes on time, a sign that companies are struggling and deferring their tax bill to meet more pressing needs such as paying employees. Industry officials say the unpaid taxes, nearly $100 million Canadian dollars for the first half of the federal fiscal year, are a canary in the coal mine, signaling a financial crisis for licensed cannabis producers, and they're urging the federal government to reconsider how the excise tax is calculated. The figure is already significantly higher than last year's total of $52.4 million. Roughly 172 Canadian businesses had an excise tax deficit owed to the Canadian Revenue Agency, the CRA, as of September, the halfway point for the federal government's fiscal year ending March 31, 2023. In September, 259 cannabis licenses were required to remit excise duty under the excise tax. That means about two-thirds of Canadian cannabis businesses regulated by the federal government are struggling to make ends meet. The number of cannabis companies with a tax debt has doubled every year since cannabis legalized adult use in 2018. As of March 2019, the figure stood at 12, rising to 33 in 2020, 68 in 2021, and 141 in March 2022. The CEO of Toronto-based cannabis producer Sensi Brands isn't surprised by the increase. When you factor price compression, excessive federal and provincial taxation, and provincial distribution fees, to name a few, there's not a lot of margin left, which is forcing licensed producers to prioritize their payables to stay afloat, said Anthony Giorgi, Sensi's chief executive. They're basically using their CRA excise tax as working capital. They'll need the working capital to keep running the company. Georgie is on the board of the Cannabis Council of Canada, which is gathering industry leaders in Ottawa, Ontario, this week to mark the fourth anniversary of legalization and push for urgent change to ensure the financial viability of the sector. Canada's excise duty imposed on producers dried cannabis is either a dollar per gram or 10% of the value of the gram, whichever is greater. Growing unpaid tax bills stem in part from the industry skating on thin financial ice, industry officials have said. They point to various factors on top of a high federal excise tax. Severe price compression reduced the average price per gram of cannabis to about 50% to $5.66 as of December 2021. The number of licensed producers entering the market is far outpacing those exiting. Most of the biggest LPs, by number of employees, continue to sell products at a steep loss, undercutting smaller rival producers. Provincial governments are siphoning too much margin, leaving little on the table for well-run businesses. And the federal government poured hundreds of millions of dollars in free COVID-19 pandemic cash into the biggest producers, worsening the already sizable oversupply of product. Federal excise debt, meanwhile, is continuing to rise. The amount owed by Canadian cannabis businesses reached $97.5 million through roughly the first six months of the current fiscal year. At the current pace, excise tax debt could reach $200 million before the end of the fiscal year in March of 2023. Overdue excise duties are the canary in the coal mine for the financial crisis facing the legal cannabis industry, said Pierre Colline, Vice President of Legislative and Regulatory Affairs for the Cannabis Council of Canada. Colleen said the data underscores the need for urgent action at the federal and provincial government level. The public health, safety, and economic gains of legalization are hanging in the balance, he said. Most of the CRA debt as of September belonged to cannabis companies based in Western Canada, consisting of Alberta, British Columbia, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan. Seventy-seven businesses in those provinces owed $57 million in overdue excise payments as of September. In Ontario, 62 businesses owed about half that amount, $28 million. And in Quebec, 14 companies had CRA debt worth $6 million. And 18 companies in Atlantic Canada, which consists of New Brunswick, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, and Prince Edward Island, owed $5.5 million. Dan Sutton, CEO of British Columbia-based cannabis producer Tantalus Labs, called the excise burden extreme and in need of reform. 
This new data paints a very clear picture that the excise burden is so extreme on producers that they are forced to defer their excise taxes payable, he said in a phone interview. This is problematic because it's not just the limited liability corporation that's liable for excise due, it's also the directors and officers of the company. Sutton said personal liabilities for directors and officers now ranks in priority with keeping their businesses alive. It's my view that this is clearly indicative that excise policy is in need of recalibration in Canada, he said. Sutton suggested that if Canada's tax collector chose to aggressively pursue unpaid excise taxes, small craft businesses would disproportionately be pushed toward insolvency, whereas the survivors of those aggressive tactics would be the companies that have the largest amount of treasury resources, likely subsidized by public market investments, he said. Sensi's Giorgio said there's an imbalance between when the federal government expects to be paid its excise and when provincial wholesale buyers, namely the OCS, pay licensed producers. The CRA expects to be paid within 30 days, whereas the OCS, the largest purchaser of cannabis in the world, pays producers only once every two months. So if you're an LP doing a significant amount of business in Ontario, I would not be surprised if a lot of those businesses who are not paying excise are delaying payment until they receive their receivables, he said. There's a gap in payment terms between the federal government's expectations in receiving excise tax within 30 days and provincial distributors, specifically the Ontario Cannabis Store, that pays the LPs net 60 days for wholesale product, thereby putting added pressure on the LPs to finance working capital and more difficult to manage cash flow. And there are two stories that clearly demonstrate that the excise tax is in need of reform. And let me also remind you that we will have Dan Sutton, CEO of Tantalus Labs, and from StandForCraft.com, on the next episode of Cannabis Podcast, and I think that may be a rather lively conversation. If you're like a lot of cannabis executives I talk to, you know the struggle. Finding the right talent in this industry is not easy. Hiring in the cannabis industry is complicated, and the traditional jobs boards aren't going to tell you everything you need to know about a candidate. Are they badged? Are they reliable? Do they really know their stuff? That's why leaders at the top cannabis companies turn to Vangst. Vangst provides all the tools you need to make the right cannabis hires from one central intuitive dashboard. Whether you're looking for on-demand temporary employees or seasoned executives, Vangst is your one-stop shop to find qualified, ready-to-go workers that are the right fit for your company. Visit Vangst.com today. That's V-A-N-G-S-T dot com to learn more about Vangst gigs, vented and marketplace products, and find out why we are proud to work in cannabis. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Cultivar Corner, Cultivar Corner, oh yeah. Cultivar Corner, please explain this stuff to me. We've returned to the Okanagan for Cultivar Corner today. And today we are featuring a product from Valhalla Flower. Now that's F-L-W-R, Valhalla. Uh, an Okanagan company, grows locally, and we are trying their rainbow lava today. And here's the first taste and smell. A Mylar bag, as so many are being distributed in these days, which I do still find a little difficult to get open. <laughs> and he struggles in there, it's finally open. Oh my, my, my. So, let me give you some details on this product. So this is Rainbow Lava from Valhalla Flower. It's three and a half grams. And let's talk about what I've got on this. The total THC is sitting at 29.2%. Uh, CBD is at 1.1%. And terpenes, 2.116% uh, is the total terps. And I find that interesting because the label... <laughs> this is Canada, right? Yes, of course it is. And the label on the front uh, has my terpenes in English and my terpenes in French, as well as the specific terpenes. We've got transcaryophylline, farnesine, and beta myrcene. Those are the three primary terpenes. But when you go to the website, and you'll find the link in the show notes, they show an awful lot of terpenes. In fact, the terpene analysis. Now, this one shows the total terpenes at 1.962% on the web. My package says 2116 uh, but it shows an awful lot more terpenes. For example, farnesine, 
transcaryophylline, beta myrcene. Then we also had some limonene, some linalool, some alpha humulene, some alpha bisabolol, some terpineol, some beta pinene, and I can't read the last one. So a lot more. <laughs> Now let's make that determination that, in fact, I got my three and a half grams of weed like I am supposed to get. And let's just make that determination here. Let's take a look at some of these buds that are in here. Oh, there's a nice one. Oh, beauty. So the first bud I pull out, 2.16. Second bud takes that up to 3.57. And that's it. Wow. <laughs> Two buds. So needless to say, they are fairly substantive buds. I took a little bit of the shake, and, and when I say shake, I'm talking about maybe two little pieces of, of leaf. <laughs> pretty good, pretty good buds. Let's get the Juniors loop and take a look at what we discover under some of these buds. So two substantial, okay, no, I'm sorry, there's three. Uh, two fairly big ones, and then one little tiny bud that kind of sits in the bottom of it. And I'm going to pull out the big guy, and let's take a look. So here's the description of what we have with Rainbow Lava. A one-of-a-kind hybrid strain made by crossing Rainbow Kush with Jungle Lava. It's a wonderful strain for a variety of consumers, excellent for pain relief. Also alleviates your mood with a mild euphoric high, letting you wind down and relax. Make sure to grab the snacks before you hit the couch. Also known to have a creative side effect, you may just want to make your own snacks. These dense and beautiful buds express a wide variety of colors, Coated in trichomes. Let's take a peek. Yeah, I would call that a trichome coating. Oh, my. This is some of the most abundant trichomes I've seen in the last week or so. And an abundance of colors. I've got some deep green, some, some lighter green, some red. Looking a little bit towards some purple. Oh, yeah, there's definitely some purple notes in there. Oh, very. So I guess there's a rainbow effect. <laughs> It carries a sweet, fruity smell with the undertones of a woody clove-like aroma containing flavors best described as spicy or peppery. This is truly a strain that will ignite all of your senses. And my senses have been ignited just from looking at this strain so far. Again, delightful array of trichomes on that. Mmm. Holding up one of those buds. Give it a bit of a squeeze because i got to prepare some for smoking. Oh, my, my, my. When that comes out, you really get those fruity aromas. Mmm. Which I'm convinced that the fruity aromas are often coming from that farnesine. At least that has been my experience of, of where we're getting some of those fruity notes. Oh, my, my, my. I am impressed with how this smells. Oh. And very nice. Like, they're, they're, they're tight buds, but they're not... Super tight. I had some the other day that was just super, super tight. And you think, how the heck do they get those nugs so nuggy? <laughs> A line I'm getting known for. It's time that we tried some of this Valhalla flower rainbow lava. The Crafty Plus is ready to go. The joint is ready to go. So here we go. Mm, pleasant taste and that initial joint hit. As usual, I don't pick up a lot of those fruity notes when I'm smoking it from the joint, but it is nice and smooth. Watch that ash develop. Nice white ash, not seeing any black. The ash falls off nicely. Now let's see what it tastes like with the Crafty Plus. Mm. And there are those fruity notes we were talking about earlier. Mm. Oh, really nice. In fact, this is this is pretty close to literally what they were talking about before. When I talk about the taste notes, uh, sweet, fruity smell, undertones of a woody, clove-like aroma. Mm. Yeah, okay. Hint of clove there. Containing flavors best described as spicy or peppery. Mm. Definitely lots of peppery notes. A strain that will ignite all of your senses. And they made some reference to that mild euphoric high that lets you wind down and relax. And so let's talk intent. What's my intent with my cultivar corner today? 
<laughs> it's not really deep. I'm just planning to get high. <laughs> Probably going to make some cookies, actually, to what they made reference to before. You may just want to make your own snacks because that creative side is, is coming out. <laughs> and that's likely what's going to happen. I'd already planned to make cookies, but I think I'm going to be doing some baking after this with a little bit more fervor. And there's that initial euphoric feeling. It's not coming on gangbusters, but I got a bit of happy eyes happening there. Mm. And just an overall general sense of, ah, I kind of like this. If I had had a different intent, let's say my intent was I wanted to get high and do a dissertation on um, the woes of the world today, that would be a different perspective. Now my intent is I just want to get high and maybe do some baking. So I think my intention is clear. You may get a sense that I have got a bit of a buzz off that. Every time I tend to ramble, it's a pretty good indication that I have gotten a buzz. Interestingly enough, only a couple of hits off the joint, which I just fired up again. And we continue to fire the Crafty Plus in my other fist. Mm, I'm liking the taste of it. So let's tell you about the folks at Valhalla Flower. Valhalla Flower is a family-run business located in the beautiful Okanagan Valley. Established in 2021 with a strong passion for growing the highest quality product to bring to our community, we have surpassed our own expectations reaching across Canada. While we strive to keep growing, we will always be family and community oriented. From our family to yours, thank you for supporting local. And we all, every one of us, likes to support local wherever we are. And whatever local may be in your particular part of the world or your particular part of Canada, Still, I think the significant amount of people who are listening to the Cannabis Podcast are Canadians, but there's a number of you around the world. Thank you for being here. I, I love having you along for the ride. I'm not saying that we are exclusively Canadian, but of course, after now four years of legalized cannabis in Canada, this show definitely has a Canadian focus. Huh. And speaking of focus, I think this is going to be a very nice day. Now, the THC on this guy was sitting at 29.2%. And there's a lot of THCs in that 29.2% or that 29% range these days. And now she's coming along a little stronger for me. Getting into more of that euphoria. Just a general, I love the just the general feeling it gives me. And, and I know <laughs> I'm not supposed to say this, but I love being high. I, I just do. <laughs> yes, it doesn't mean that I'm thinking enough about other things in my life, but right now, all I'm concerned about is whether or not I'm getting high, and I am. Valhalla flower, rainbow lava, very, very colorful buds, lots of diversity of color in that. Get yourself a jeweler's loop, take a look at that flower, you will see the abundance of trichome fields inside of that. Nice taste, smooth smoke, and a pretty good high. Valhalla Flower, I like to promote local. And as I am wont to do sometimes after turning the recorder off and then letting the cannabis roll around in my brain for a little while, <laughs> as it connects with my CB1 receptors in my brain and spinal cord, it's giving me some fairly significant euphoria and some pretty laid-back feelings. I'm really liking this. I think this is going to be adding to my creativity for the day, adding to my enjoyment for the day. Maybe I'm going to make some cookies. Maybe we'll do some geocaching too, because that's kind of fun. So update, I am liking the Valhalla flower, rainbow lava. For me right now, it's looking like it's a pretty good daytime smoke as well. Of course, your experience with cannabis will be unique to you. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. This is the Cannabis Podcast. And I thought it was kind of appropriate since we are celebrating the fact that cannabis has been legal in Canada for four years now. Where else? Where else in the world is it legal? And, and is there any other place where there is, it is as legal as it is here? I wanted to know. Inquiring minds wanted to know. Well, this is a story from THCAffiliates.com. Their tagline is, the business of cannabis 
Where in the world is weed legal? Which countries and states have legalized recreational marijuana and which are the most likely to do so in the near future? Recreational cannabis use is legal and regulated in Uruguay in 2013 and Canada 2018. There are also many countries where cannabis use has been decriminalized, such as Jamaica, South Africa, Georgia, Mexico, and the Netherlands. Cannabis laws are rapidly changing. In the United States, cannabis is still illegal at the federal level, but many individual states have passed recreational marijuana laws. Recreational cannabis use is legal in 19 states, Alaska, Arizona, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Illinois, Maine, Massachusetts, Michigan, Montana, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, Nevada, Oregon, Rhode Island, Vermont, Virginia, and Washington, plus D.C., the Northern Mariana Islands, and Guam. Of course, Canada, as we well are aware, <laughs> recreational use of marijuana has been legal in Canada since October 17, 2018, when it was signed into legislation under the Trudeau government. The Cannabis Act is the national legal framework of Canadian cannabis regulations for consuming, growing, producing, while the individual provinces and municipalities control retail and local bylaws. Canada and CBD products. Something important to note about Canada versus the U.S. is that CBD products are regulated strictly in Canada, more like medicine versus in the United States. In the U.S., celebrities like Tommy Chong and Martha Stewart had their own CBD brands, and you can buy every form of CBD imaginable from corner stores. But in Canada, of course, CBD products are only available from licensed dispensaries and much rarer overall. Also, Canada has much stricter cannabis advertising and marketing guidelines. No celebrity endorsements, no logos, no making any cannabis products seem cool. Canada's tobacco marketing laws are also very strict. Uruguay was the first country to fully legalize recreational cannabis use. President Jose Mujica signed legislation that legalized recreational cannabis in December 2013. Jamaica is commonly associated with marijuana, but the country didn't decriminalize weed until 2015. Although cannabis is still illegal, possession under two ounces for personal use is decriminalized, though small fines might be issued. European countries have varying laws concerning marijuana. In the Netherlands, people have been selling marijuana in coffee shops since the 1970s, Marijuana use is decriminalized, but citizens must not cause a disturbance while under the influence. <laughs> Interesting twist. And businesses cannot sell more than five grams of marijuana to a customer at a time. Speaking of bizarre twists. Marijuana laws are relaxed in Portugal, and those who are charged with marijuana possession more than once will likely receive rehab instead of jail time. In Spain, individuals cannot use marijuana in public without being fined. Most people in Spain who use marijuana do so privately and have formed social clubs as a way to avoid using marijuana in public. France has strict but changing marijuana laws. People who are caught consuming marijuana could receive spot fines, might be required to take a drug awareness class, and could spend up to a year in prison, though jail time is rare. However, France is also piloting a medical cannabis program, giving patients free marijuana starting in March of 2021. And, of course, what countries are coming next? Well, it was just announced just this last week that Germany is proceeding with making recreational cannabis legal in their country. Switzerland, since 2012, possession of 10 grams or less has been decriminalized, and in recent years they've been making strides towards more robust legalization. Mexico, as of June 2021, cannabis is legal for private recreational use in Mexico. And while cannabis is illegal in the United Kingdom, medical cannabis has had growing support in the UK over the last decade. Medical use with licensing has been permitted since November of 2018. And as we look around the world and we see where cannabis is legal and where it isn't, I thought it was also interesting time to take a peek at some of the data I get in regards to the Cannabis Podcast. And let me say thanks to people who are listening in and this is in the top 10, from number 10 to number 1. The State of Israel, thanks for being here. The Republic of France, 
and now we know a little bit about the French laws in regards to cannabis, Ukraine. Wow. I am so sorry you were going through what you were going through right now. I'm hoping that maybe smoking a joint can at least make you forget about the horror of the war for a little bit. The Republic of Germany, well, in a few weeks or a few months, perhaps, you'll be able to join along in the recreational cannabis use. The Kingdom of Spain, Japan, the United Kingdom, Commonwealth of Australia. Wonder if one of those might be my daughter. <laughs> the United States and Canada. There's the top 10 countries around the world that are listening to the Cannabis Podcast. And now we know that the legalization is spreading around the world, and we are no longer alone. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you being a listener and for your support of the podcast. If you ever have any comments about anything you hear, please send a note to info at CannabisPodcast.com. If you would like to support even further, you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash Cannabis Podcast Explore the options there. If you like what you hear and you feel so inclined, you can even buy me a doobie. That's it for episode 109 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the Cannabis Infused Studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Thanks for listening to today's show. To check out more great cannabis podcasts, go to podconnects.com. Here's a preview of one of our other shows. Cannabis Health Radio is a podcast about stories from people around the world who have used cannabis to deal with serious ailments, many of them life-threatening. My name is Ian Jessup. My co-host, Corey Yelland, is no stranger to the devastating emotional impact faced by so many people receiving a death sentence diagnosis from a doctor. Told she only had months to live with anal canal cancer, Corey researched and immediately began using cannabis oil to eliminate her cancer and has been cancer-free for more than a decade. She told herself that if it worked, she would spend the rest of her life helping others, which she does tirelessly every day. When you listen to our podcast, you'll hear many stories like Corey's, along with others who have used cannabis oil for many more ailments besides cancer, such as chronic pain, PTSD, MS, and many, many more. As one of our guests said, your podcast gave me the confidence to save my own life. We regularly get messages from listeners who have heard our podcast and use cannabis to solve a serious health issue of their own or that of a loved one. We hope you listen to these stories and be as inspired and moved as we are with each and every episode.